Hey everybody, it's Chris from Chris Beat Cancer, and today I'm interviewing someone that uh, I've really been looking forward to interviewing for some time. Her name is Sunshine Hook, and three years ago, her son, Tyler, was diagnosed with stage four medulloblastoma, that's brain cancer, and was treated and sent home to die. And today, he is alive and well and cancer free. So I, I just can't, I'm so excited, first of all, uh, to know that Tyler's doing well. And uh, I can't wait to see the response to this video, but you came up to Memphis to St. Jude. So let's, let's hear the, tell me the story. Well, our son was diagnosed at three years old. So um, we brought him into the emergency room. Uh, the, the closest one is like an hour and a half away. So. Um, when we drove him there, they sent us home saying he had a virus, and we had a feeling that it wasn't a virus. But now, anyway, what was going on? Like with seizures, a fever? What was? He was very lethargic, and he was laying around and not acting himself. And um, he would wake up and he would go straight to the to throw up, and it kind of looked like morning sickness, like a woman would have. Um, but then he would be fine throughout the day, and he would eat. Um, he was constipated though. So that was a big, um, sign that something was wrong. And when they told us he had a virus, we knew it was not accurate because when you have a stomach bug, you have diarrhea, not constipation. So, um, you know, those were just dead giveaways that something was wrong and that they were misdiagnosing him, but they misdiagnosed him quite a few times. Cause we went back a couple more times and third time, I think it was, they finally did a CT scan, um, and they found the largest tumor that was at the back of his skull. Um, and then they had to biopsy it, and they had, well, let me back it up a little bit. He had so much pressure from that tumor blocking the fluid that's supposed to flow um, from your brain down your spine um, that they had to drain it to relieve some of the pressure and then they had to biopsy the tumor and see if it was cancerous. And, um, it just kind of took off after, after the biopsy and they got the results back. Then it was a rush, rush and do something, you know, we need to act quick. So, um, when they biopsied it and found out that it was cancerous, um, they were pushing for us to go to St. Jude's because they said that was the best option for him at that time because their success rate at Gainesville was where we went, Gainesville, Florida. Um, I think they call it UF Shands or something like that now. Um, they couldn't treat him. They didn't have a good um, percentage of success. It's like under 50% chance he would live if we would have stayed there. So our, our success rate was to go to St. Jude. Um, and so he was kind of whisked away, him and my husband. They flew out to uh, Le Bonner to get more brain done to get try to remove the tumors that could be removed by surgery. How many were there? Uh, I think there were 16 altogether. 16 tumors? Yes, there was. The biggest one, and then there were smaller ones, and then there was two on the spine that had traveled down the spine. They were smaller, um, but yeah, there was there was quite a bit in his small little head. Um, so of course we were very scared when, you know, and we were very rushed, but we felt like the doctors had our son's best interest in mind. My husband went with him, and I stayed with the other children. We have five children total. Um, he went with him and did the brain, uh, surgery, um, and had radiation almost immediately after that. Um, six, he had six, I actually have the protocol thing that he went through right here because I try to forget these details. Um, well, let me ask you this before you get into it. Did they, were they able to remove all the tumors or just some of them? No, just some of them. They a lot of them were in spots that were very dangerous. I understand. So they were only able to, re, you know, do a little bit. So they took think, some tumors out. They did some right. radiation, 
and then they did chemotherapy. Right. Okay. And it was six weeks of um, high dose radiation in spinal. So it went all the way down his spine because they said that because he had the tumors that went down there, they had to radiate that area also. Um, so he did radiation with my husband there and I stayed at home and luckily I had people send me websites like crispycancer.com to keep me company while I was at home by myself. Um, while I was, you know, as a mother, you want to do anything and everything for your child. Um, and you feel helpless when they get a cancer diagnosis because, you know, I wasn't even able to be there with them when they went through radiation. So, um, you know, I was busy studying up natural things while my husband was away with Tyler doing radiation. And it was, um, it was really hard to say the least, um, to be away from them and to also know that they were going through this alone, kind of, you know, I'm going to start crying. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, it's just hard to talk about the yeah. past, you know, and, and when he went through the chemo and, um, I don't mean to jump ahead or get ahead of myself, but um, when he went through the chemo, he was supposed to do seven months and he was only able to do five months of the chemo. The fifth round almost took his life. Um, it took away his speech and um, and he just started going downhill. Like he, he had trouble breathing. They were giving him antibiotics constantly saying that, you know, just in case we're going to give him these antibiotics, just in case he has an infection or just in case, you know, it was always like pumping him full of antibiotics. I never understood that part. That's when he was sent home on hospice. They, they said there was nothing more they could do. Uh, the cancer was coming back and they had already hit it with the strongest chemos they had. And that felt like an open door. I know it's the weirdest thing to say, but that felt like a door that no man could open because now we could control things that I had been researching and I had been praying the whole time that he was going through treatment and I forgot to tell that I went up there when he was going through chemo I was able to be there thank God um, but when he was going through that treatment I just had to keep praying and praying and praying because it was the hardest thing I ever had to witness um, you know, him just deteriorating and needing blood transfusions and um, getting to the part where he was skin and bones and looked like a child from a third world country, except for he didn't have the big belly. But he was so skinny. It was scary, you know, and then he got so pale white um, right when they were going to send him home. We almost thought he wasn't going to make the trip home. But, you know, I'm just thankful that all of that is in the past and he is doing very well and he's gained his weight back and, um, and, and he's cancer free. That's, that is the best part of this whole horrid <laughs> is that he's cancer free and he is going to make a full recovery. I, I just feel it. I know it. He's, he's done amazing things in the two years that he's been home. Um, I mean, he's celebrated, He's six years old now, so it feels like longer. It feels like he's been home. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, when they're sent home on hospice, I think they would they would give up and just throw the towel in. And I and I am so excited about this interview because I people hope to not just throw the towel in. And the doctor doesn't know it all, and they're not God. And God deserves all the glory and honor and praise for our son being healed from this cancer because he didn't do it overnight, like a miraculous instant kind of thing, but he healed our son, no doubt with wisdom of natural things that we could try with him. And the plant-based is awesome. Let me just tell you. Say that again. The plant-based diet has been phenomenal for him. He's on an organic, um, formula for feeding tubes it's called liquid hope yeah and it's awesome like it's the best thing out there for for critically ill children i think all of them should and, have well and not just children for anyone who is has right. to have a feeding tube right right or if you need meal replacement shakes like what what they would typically give insure or boost 
to a and cancer now, patient, Liquid yeah. Hope is, is an absolutely phenomenal alternative to that. Yes, it is. I love it. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about what you did when you got him home. When we first got home, the first thing we switched before we left the, the doctors in St. at St. Jude's, we said we wanted them to prescribe this liquid hope because they wouldn't prescribe it when he was going through treatment. They wanted us to be on their pediasure, you know, filler food or whatever it is, you know, not real food. So we said we did it, you know, basically we did it your way and now we want to do it our way and we want this prescription, please. You know, we, we've tried, um, to tell you that we wanted this nutrition and you wouldn't give it to us before. Now we want it. We want to, you know, and, and luckily they gave, they gave us our wishes. They, they wrote the prescription for it and now it's covered by his insurance and we don't have to buy it out of pocket like we used to, you know, so it's one of where we, we knew his diet needed. We tried to, we tried to feed him healthy things through the feeding tube when we were going through treatment but the doctors kept telling us, oh, he could get a soil-based bacteria or something. And yeah. that's it. So, you know, we changed his diet right away. Um, we did a lot of detoxing. Um, we added lots of supplements, um, Kyo greens being one of them for the, um, you know, the, all the greens that he, he needed um, that we couldn't always juice for him sometimes. So... And to help his bowels, we had to get him on probiotics right away because of all the antibiotics. If I wouldn't have found out about probiotics, I swear he would have went septic on us because he was so backed up from all the morphine and the chemo. And, um, well, it's you know, not just antibiotics. Chemo therapy destroys the lining of your digestive tract and good right. bacteria. And then antibiotics does even more damage. So it's, it's a double whammy. Oh, yes. It was horrible. And if I – and and – I just thank God that I found out about it at the right time. I'm on it daily. Um, and you know, I give him, I give him extra sometimes just because I know he needs to build that, um, good bacteria back up because he's been hit with antibiotics even after we like, uh, he hadn't been on antibiotics for, you know, almost the whole two years he had been home and then his G tube got infected and they put us on the strongest antibiotic they could. So we, we had to double up again on the probiotics because he was starting to get constipated again and, and having all those symptoms you don't want your child to have because he's immobile. He can move around a little bit. He can crawl a little bit now, but most of the time he's still immobile cause he can't walk. Um, so we want to make sure that he's having good movements regularly and that's we know how important that is you know for him to um and as we're talking about poop but people don't understand how important it is <laughs> with your gut being mm -hmm. your second brain basically or your your that's where the source of disease can happen is in your gut and people don't understand how important probiotics are so they I just want to drive that one home that they're very they've been a lifesaver for our son Yep. And what brand do you rotate brands or do you have one you like? Um, well, we use the scoopable kind, not the capsule so we can put it in his food. So we've used, um, the garden of life and we've also used, um, can't remember the name of the other one, but they're both kid ones yeah, and garden they're of both life, kids probiotics. Yep. The raw. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we like to get a high strain, you know, whichever one we try to get the most for the kids, whatever. I think it's like four or five, I can't remember if it's million or billion. Yeah. I don't know. But right. It's a lot. <laughs> we get the highest one that we can find for him um, because he can never have enough after what he's been through. Um, so, yeah, the probiotics and then. So you were juicing for him, I know, right? I, yeah, we were juicing before we got Liquid Hope. We would juice for him when we were at St. Jude's. What kind of juices? Um, because we did all greens, mostly um kale and uh, spinach, whatever we could get our hands on that was organic and that was green, mm -hmm. we juiced for him. So there was not always a recipe. We just kind of threw it in there and he didn't have to taste it because he had the feeding tube, which yeah, was a blessing. Easy. <laughs> you can you it put does. together a pretty funky blend of greens and just put it in the feeding that's tube. That's right. That's right. And I, and, and that's one of the, that's probably one of the only things 
that was a blessing that came out of the treatment was the feeding tube. And I'm thankful for that feeding tube every day because uh, you know how picky children can be when, when you're trying to get them to eat healthy. So. Okay. So you had the, the greens and then you found about liquid hope and you started doing that. Right. And probiotics. Anything else? Yes. Um, we actually, we had always, um, there was a nurse up at Le Bonner that had given us uh, a big thick book that was called uh, Phoenix Tears or something. I'm sure you heard of Rick Simpson and all that. Yeah. Um, so she, oil. Right. She had told us about that and we could never try it because we were in Tennessee and it wasn't legal there. And um, when he was sent home terminal, we were able to get here in Florida and we did that and it replaced all of his meds. He was on seizure medication too, because he had a history of seizures from the brain slash surgeries that he went through. Mm -hmm. So he, um, when we got him on the CBD oil, we followed the Rick's protocol. Rick Simpson uh, protocol. Got it. And then uh, we kept him on a mate, which he's currently on a maintenance dose because he has seizure in his history and every now and then he'll have seizure activity that'll pop up and we don't want that to get out of control because um, when he was on his anti-seizing meds, he would still have seizures. And when we use the CBD oil, we found that it controls the seizures better and it has less harmful side effects. So, um, That's great. yeah, I'm just amazed. And, and it's all plants, you know, you just think about God made all these plants and we don't realize the medicinal value until you know, something like this happens and then you're kind of thrown into, you know, do I use the pharmaceuticals that they keep giving me or try something natural and see if it works. So far, the natural stuff has worked far above and beyond all the pharmaceuticals he was, um, you know, prescribed. So we're thankful that we found that. And, um, you know, we, we've used everything from apricot seed, apricot kernels and, We've tried every, um, we use a lot of coconut oil with him. Um, we, we just have tried it. I don't think there's anything we have not tried, um, that I've heard about that's been good for cancer patients, people recovering from, uh, you know, chemo treatment and trying to detox and things like that. So was there a point where you, where you realized that what you were doing was working? I mean, cause obviously when you got him home, he was. Oh, yes. In really, really bad shape, right? Yeah. He was very rough. Um, when did actually, things start to change? Three months into it, he started to improve very well, and we were able to cancel hospice. Um, that's when he started having more improvements, and the probiotics were, I think it took a while for them to build up their colony. Um, but three months into being home, we felt confident enough to cancel hospice and to actually get another MRI to see what was going on and see if the cancer had gone away. So three months in, we saw improvement. And ever since then, he has had improvement. He's had a little bumps along the way, like um, random seizures out of nowhere sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that was when we were working kinks out. We were still on the Keppra, the anti-seizing medicine, and we were still... Uh, I, I think his brain just needed to recover. So I think people don't know what really causes seizures all the time. So I think it was his brain maybe rewiring or repairing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes he had a salt wasting issue where he would, um, if we gave him too much drink, he would pee too much sodium out or something. They called it salt wasting. So he would have a low sodium seizure from that. And then once you corrected the sodium issue, which I use bone broth now mixed in with the liquid hope, um, because I know all the benefits of bone broth and, um, and that helps the sodium. We have any issues with his sodium since. So, um, I mean, he's just been doing well ever since three months at <laughs> being, I mean, he was given weeks to live. Yeah. So, and did that first MRI, what did you see on the first one? The first one was clear. It didn't have any any sign of disease. Um, it might have still had the hydrocephalus, which he left the hospital with hydrocephalus. Mm -hmm. 
um, which they called it chronic hydrocephalus. What they said it would never go away or it would stay about that. But he still has his shunt, so that's supposed to help fluid regulation, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, and and now that I say that, um, the oncologist, the last time we went, he now says that it. Now that he thinks of it, it wasn't the cancer coming back. It was probably necrosis. But then I said, what? Well, if it was necrosis, wouldn't it still show up on the on the MRIs now because, you know, like some doctors don't believe that the brain can repair itself. They, once it has dead tissues, the dead tissues, I guess, still stay there or something. I don't know. Like necrosis doesn't go away, I guess, mm-hmm. or kind of like the hydrocephalus, but they can't in his case. So they just say, maybe it wasn't the cancer coming back now that they think of it. Now it was necrosis that was showing up instead of cancer. But I totally believe with the research that I have read, about those three chemos that he was on, they have had to early terminate other children from the protocols because the cancer was coming back. I, without a doubt, believe it was cancer because he said in his expert opinion um, at that time that it was cancer. So now he's going back kind of on his word and saying, well, maybe it was necrosis now that I... And they had him on, you said, cyclophosphamide, fincristine, and cisplatin. Yes, and two other experimental drugs, which they referred to as Jim and PIM because they're hard to pronounce, but they're usually, I think, breast cancer or um, some other kind of one cancer. One of them might be gemcitabine. Right, that's the one. And then the other one was a PIM, PIMtrexid or something, PIMtrext, PIMetrex, I don't know, it's a weird, they called them Jim and PIM and they used them together. So... Um, Anyways, uh, well, so t- talk about your experience at St. Jude, because I know you've you've you and I have talked about this, um, right. you know, and uh, having been there, like, what would you what would you tell a brand new parent that had a kid that was maybe about to go to St. Jude? Um, I would say do your research and don't follow the doctors blindly. Um, they're, they're a great facility. And they had a great vision from the founder, Danny Thomas, but um, they're not, I don't think they're cutting edge on a lot of their trials. I I think they're maybe in their leukemia ward, they're, they're having progress, but with the solid tumors, I don't think they're having as much progress as they might be putting out there. So I would just caution them to do their own research on um, natural things and try to do the natural with the chemo. If they have to do the chemo and radiation, I would definitely, um, have a it if you can. Um, you know, if the child doesn't have a feeding tube, obviously it's harder. Um, but if they do have a feeding tube, I would ask for liquid hope. Um, because, Good nutrition is going to be the best thing for their children while they're going through those awful treatments. And even though uh, the doctors tell you to feed them whatever they want, sugar feeds cancer and kids shouldn't be eating Oreo and, uh, you know, whatever they feel like it just because they're... m and ice cream. Right, right. And, and it's sad because that mother, that when they were feeding my son steroids and my son craved pizza and... Oreos and pancakes. I gave him whatever he wanted because I didn't know better. And now looking back, I regret that. And I wish somebody would have told me, um, that sugar fed camp because that would have been the last thing I would have been feeding my sick child. Um, but anyways, that's pretty much the, the only thing I can say as far as advice for them going into a clinical trial. They're not, um, they're, they're not as cracked up, all cracked up as, you know, they say they are. Um, just be careful and, and do your own research, even when the doctors tell you not to research. Um, it doesn't hurt to have a backup plan, and I'm so thankful that I had a backup plan when my son was sent home because after being like hell, I couldn't just imagine going home and letting him die and not giving it all I have. You know, I couldn't imagine... Um, you know, I just couldn't imagine to, that was, that was like me fighting for him. That was the last hoorah. (laughs) I wasn't going to just throw the towel in and I'm glad I didn't because 
is today. He, he's doing great for what he's been through. And he, he's going to reach when he gets older and he's going to be a light for, for natural healing. I'm just so, I know this is our ministry now. I know that God is going to uh, restore him and, and he's going to be a testimony to parents and children going through this. And I, I just can't wait to be an encouragement to everyone. Um, uh, you told me something I thought was hilarious about the, um, the computer lab at St. Jude. Oh, yes. Um, every time we go to St. Jude's, there's a little library upstairs. And I changed the homepage to Chris Beat Cancer so that so that I'm doing my little part of paying it forward so that people can see that there's a better way to kill cancer and not kill the patient. I really want to write a book. Kill cancer, not the patient. I'm sure somebody's already written that title with that title, but it, there's one. There's one title pretty close. My friend Bob Wright right. is called "Killing Cancer, Not People." <laughs> right, right. And yeah. and people don't understand that um, that th that toxic way is not the only way. Like right. they think that because their doctor said that's the only way, um, that that's what they have to do to get better. And it's and it needs to change. People need to hear about you and how you. Um, own cancer basically got rid of it well, not just me you know? I, I know and you not have lots me. of testimonies on your site that's why i put it on there because i want people i want the word to get out i made stickers that say crispbeatcancer.com on my van so that when i drive around people will look up that website and and have knowledge you know knowledge is power and um, it even says in the Bible, people perish, my people perish from lack of knowledge. That's right. So I just want to do the Lord's work. You know, I used to believe everything happened for a reason, even though I don't like to think that my son got cancer for a reason. But if it's to glorify God and, and tell about plants that God put here, good, then so be it. You know, my son... It will make a full recovery and he will be well and he will he will talk with his own mouth and tell people what it has done for him. So, you know, we went through a lot of suffering, but if in the end there's lots of joy and there's lots of people that <laughs> find healing through this, then I am okay with the suffering that we had to go through to make a big difference, you know, in other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, Well, you... Um... And so, well, right now he's, he's, so he's still suffering from some of the after effects of treatment. Right. But he's not, um, uh, the CBD oil too helps with pain. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he is not, I make sure that he is comfortable. He's not doped up or anything. You know, like so many people get it wrong and they say, oh, I don't want to give that to my child because it'll make them high. He's not doped up. He's happy. Like if it makes him, if the worst side effect is it makes him giggle, um, then I'm okay with that because morphine was the worst of all the drugs, I think, because he would have morphine withdrawals and it would make him constipated and it was his body. Well, morphine, opiate-based pain medicine uh, promotes right. metastasis. A right. lot of people don't know that, but I mean, right. they give morphine to cancer patients and it, it increases metastasis. Right. It makes the cancer spread. Like it just makes doctors, me sick. I mean, the, yeah. the research is clear. It's, it's out there. It's published. I'll put links to it below the video in the show notes. I mean, it's crazy that people don't know this. I mean, not that people don't know it, that people aren't told this, that doctors right. Right. aren't telling people this and demanding for alternatives, you know? Right. But, um, yeah, that's, it's just insane. Yeah, it is. And my eyes are open to a lot of things now. Like before, I believed a lot of lies or I was misguided about a lot of things. And now my eyes are wide open. And I I try to share it with other people. But like I didn't write out a protocol for anybody to follow to um, help them because everybody's different. And if I wrote out all the things I did, with, they'd probably feel over before they even began. And I, I wrote, um, there was one, there was um, that did a blog post about children and, and how they're, how they're, um, 
how they would, when you want to decline chemotherapy, um, just don't is her, is her little post, but she's talking about how moms, um, say that they would, they wouldn't put their child through that. They would do natural, um, they would do it all natural if they could, but CPS, um, uh, is and does take children away and force chemo on them. So I understand where she's coming from, but I want people to have a backup plan. The chemotherapy and the radiation fails their child, which it does. I don't know how much percentage of the time, but well, it depends it, on the type of cancer, right? That's right. So, like you right. said earlier, and you know, just to be clear for anyone that's you know doesn't know what we're talking about, um, childhood leukemia has a very high success rate. You know, ninety percent right. live ten years or more. Um, right. And so that's great. The cancer industry has made tremendous progress with childhood leukemia, right? Uh, as well as some lymphomas and testicular cancer. So those cancers, they've done a great job at improving survival. But right. when we're talking about solid tumor cancers, breast, colon, brain, liver, lung, ovarian, um, pancreatic, cervical, those type of can cancers have had very little progress in the death rate right. in since the 1950s there's been right. very little survival progress and, right. and i don't mean like five-year survival i mean the actual death rate so but most people don't know that and uh, they're not told that by their doctor when they're diagnosed and uh you know you mentioned um cps child protective services taking away children and um you know we've seen that happen multiple times i mean there's a few i can mention and i'll link to these in the show notes but you know, there's a documentary film called Cut, Poison, Burn about right. a child with brain cancer whose parents um, tried to get permission to uh, get him off chemo and treat him naturally. And they were forced to treat him with chemo. And it's, it's a brutal story. And he died as a result of right. the chemotherapy. The chemo right. killed him. Um, and then Sarah Hershberger was an Amish girl who um, her I interviewed her grandfather Mm. And it's on the blog, but they, they, she was diagnosed with, uh, I think uh, it was, I think it was a lymphoma and it might've been leukemia. I can't remember, but, um, I'll link to it. But anyway, yeah, they tried to come take her away and, and her, her parents hit the road and went into hiding and right. took her down to Mexico and had her treated. And she's, that was years ago. She's doing great. She's alive and well and doing fine. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, and then there's one more story that, um, Cassandra Callender was diagnosed with lymphoma at 17, mm. 17 years old, w wanted to refuse chemotherapy. And her mother, they both agreed. And uh, the, the medical establishment, the government, took her away from her parents, from her mom, and forced chemotherapy on her at 17 years old. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's insane. And, and her cancer actually came back afterward. She had to go through yeah. all the treatments. She was a hostage in the hospital mm -hmm. and um, went through all the treatments, got, you know, remission temporarily. But then the cancer came back shortly thereafter. And she's still alive okay. as far as I know and is tr doing some natural things. And I'm not sure what her status is at this point. But the, the, the reason I told that story is because, I mean, how cra crazy is it that a girl could go get an abortion Without right. her parents' permission, at seventeen, mm. but she can't say no to chemotherapy. Right. I mean, that's insane. Completely it, insane. So that that's what that's the country we live in, right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, there there's a very um, there's a lack of medical freedom that right. parents have, and and even like I said, a seventeen year old teenager has over their own body, whether or not they want chemo or not. I mean, that's just right. You know, I have to stop talking or my head will explode. But it's uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's you know, having a kid with cancer is a very, very tough decision. I mean, you know, you either go you either go through all the treatments. Maybe you're in a state where like I, I do know a couple other examples, like uh, my friend Jared, who you can look up on Facebook, um, a kid against chemo, uh, right. he refused chemotherapy and got well and is doing terrific as a teenager. Um, so there are stories like that where f there was a, a set of circumstance or depending on the state they were in, they were right. able to avoid treatment and get right. well. Or yeah. others, like I said, just went into hiding, went to Mexico and just said, no, we're not doing it that way. Right. Um, 
But those are the two options. If you're forced into it, you've got to, you know, make the best of it and really try to hammer the nutrition into your kid right. and really try to support them as much as you can while they're going through the system. Yeah. Yeah. Or you just, you know, got to like, uh, <laughs> got to just hit the road and, you know, right. go underground and try to try to get them well on your own. Right. Well, if you don't mind, if I read this, um, this would be my reply to the mom who says, um, you know, I, I think it's hard to share, like, I'll just read it. And then, um, hopefully it'll make it without reading her, her blog long thing. She's basically saying that her son or child was diagnosed with leukemia and she has people telling her about natural things, but um, she feels cornered. And I think most parents feel cornered um, when they're when they get this diagnosis. But, um, you know, it is right that this will try to take your child away in some cases, depending on what state you're in. Definitely. Um, I have found moms put in this situation feel so helpless, like I did and scared and lost and discouraged that they hang on to every word from their doctor as their only hope. Because natural cancer cures, well, that's uncharted territory and there's no map to guide you. So you cling to the doctor's way because at least they have a plan and it takes some of the weight off of you as a parent. Um, and a lot of parents get offended when about natural treatments because they're fearful that their child will fail because there's no treatment protocol that they can follow that sometimes with their child, depending on if they have a feeding tube or, you know, will eat healthy. Um, so when they hear 90% 90, 90 success rate from the doctors, it makes them feel like that's the only way to save their child's life. That's how we felt. Fear is a big in the cancer realm. When the doctors unload all the possibilities, you become overwhelmed and feel defeated before you even begin. So I understand these moms out there that are concerned and why they're so offended when somebody shares natural things because they want to be a good mom, but that just got a lot harder when you want to be a good mom and then you're, you're being pushed all at all sides. Um, I like to think we would all choose a more natural approach to cancer if there was more who have gone before us to show us exactly how to like you have. Um, and it is scary to know you really don't have a choice in your child's treatment unless you have a great lawyer who can prove you're making the best choice for your child. Adults can refuse treatment with no problem, but it is not so for a child. So in hindsight, I wish we could have done all natural with Tyler, but I am glad that God worked out the way he did so that there would be no doubt that we were doing what was best for our son. So nobody can go back and say, you know, we, we were neglecting him by not giving him chemo treatments. Um, it is hard for me to talk to other cancer moms sometimes because they have their guard up and they are, and they almost have to believe in what they're doing for their child is the best option to help them get through. And I understand that. I totally get it. Yeah, but it's yeah. not going to keep me from sharing what has worked for our son. And I'm glad that people shared natural things for with me when Tyler was diagnosed. Um, that was the best thing they could have done. Um, my, hus my husband wasn't thrilled all the time, but that's because he was having to go through the radiation and he felt like his hands were tied. Um, we all, we had to figure it out for ourselves, even though people shared what they did to cure their own cancer, but he's healing uh, of cancer. Their journeys are all unique. So I think um, everybody should try what works best for them, but they should definitely try natural. Um, even when the doctors say, you know, oh, I don't think you should try that, uh, that herb over there, you know, it, the herbs aren't going to hurt you. It's the chemo and radiation that does all the damage. Um, we prayed a lot of wisdom and I had Ty prayed over multiple times and the statistics about St. Jude's are accurate probably for the leukemia side, but the success rate is very low for all the other cancers that are treated there. And almost all of them relapse at around two years after treatment. 
So I think their success rate for the leukemia to proclaim that they're saving lives, I think in cures, uh, if they're using old and ineffective chemos um, that have been proven to bring back, basically, they're carcinogens. They're giving people carcinogens. So imagine God cures any children that have been cured there because somehow St. Jude's gets all the credit if there is a child that's cured at their location. And in my opinion, it is by the grace of God that anybody makes it out of their life. And I'm not laughing to be mocking. It is just amazing the children get there that take away their limbs and take away their eyes and um, debilitate them even more so than my son was debilitated. I mean, that fifth round almost proved fatal for our son, but they, it didn't, and he's making a recovery. Anyway, so that is... You, um, he, you had another scan last month, right? February 2017? Yes. On Valentine's weekend, we had to be at St. Jude's, and it was the best Valentine's present ever. Uh, clear scans. Um, you know, he's still blowing the doctors away and baffling them, and they don't understand because he's supposed to have signs of cancer coming back by now. And they still want to see him every six months. So we're happy to share his um, his clear results every time. And we, we don't have scan anxiety kind of like other parents do. Um, our worry is having to put him under, like they sedate him for the MRI, and that's and, and they have to put an IV in, and that's the that's the worst part of it because he got his port removed, um, so he has to be accessed every time uh, through a regular IV, and that's a pain. <laughs> but you know he he does very well um, every time. I think he gets stronger, and um, you know it, it's been I don't know how many MRIs later, and each one of them's been clean, so I cannot complain. Um, to, to be able to share that with them and have that in their records that a boy sent home on hospice is now cancer free is like, it, it's what pushes me through, uh, every trip we have to make up there. <laughs> well, I, I know you're going to give a lot of parents, um, hope and encouragement that, that, you know, they didn't even know was possible. Right. I mean, just I hearing your so. story and I just am so happy to know that he's doing well and, you know, praise the Lord. I mean, what can you say? It's like just such an awesome thing and uh, looking forward to keeping up. Yes. Right? Just keeping up yes. with his progress. Yes. I want to stay in touch and definitely um, meet you one of these days when we're in Memphis. Yeah, next time you come up. Yeah, that would be great. Let's do it. I'd love to meet him. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, hopefully he'll be talking some by then. <laughs> but I don't, I, I think our appointment's around August or something like that. So, if you're not out of town, maybe we'll get to see you. Oh, I, I will probably be here, but obviously you've got my phone number, so <laughs> right, right. send me a text and we'll we'll get together for sure. I will. Meet up at Whole Foods. There you go. <laughs> we love that place. Yep, yep. That was the only place in town. I mean, you know, I, when I had cancer, I lived in Memphis. I still do. And there was only one Whole Foods in the whole city. And back right. then, it was 2004. I mean, they were the only place that had organic produce pretty much. I mean, now right. you can get organic produce almost anywhere. But right. they were the like the one beacon of light <laughs> in a city full of like beer and barbecue and McDonald's right. restaurants, right. <laughs> like fast food on every corner and and barbecue joints. So anyway, Sunshine, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share your story and Tyler's story. And uh, we'll stay in touch, obviously. Friends, if you're watching this, please share it with anybody you know that has cancer or, you know, wants to learn and understand that there are more options out there and people are healing and getting well. And uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. Subscribe to my blog, chrisbeatcancer.com, to stay up to date on awesome interviews like this and uh, nutrition and natural therapies for healing cancer. So anyway, again, thank you everyone so much for watching and uh, we'll see you very soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.